Hi all. I think there are some chess games that are just so good that one should try and revisit them and look at them again from different perspectives. Now one of the games that I consider really exceptional was from Bobby Fisher, Robert James Fisher, when he was 13 years old in 1956. It was October 1956, played at the Marshall Chess Club. It was at Fisher's first adult tournament, an invitational tournament, that was a result of Bobby Fischer winning the US Junior Championship three months earlier. And it was the Rosenwald Tournament, so the first adult All Masters Tournament of Fischer's career. And in the seventh round, uh, Fischer was paired against Donald Byrne. Donald Byrne was an international master and a former US Open champion. The Rosenwald tournament, by the way, was named after Lessing J. Rosenwald, who was the former chairman of Sears Roebuck, who was an important art collector and chess patron. So let's have a look at this fantastic game again. Let's see, Knight F3 from Donald Byrne playing white. So not too committal, can transpose into various things like the English opening. Fisher played knight f6, so symmetrical reply. And we do have a signal for the English opening here, c4. Fisher played g6. At this stage, it can go into various kind of terrains here. An English opening, a king's engine type position. White plays knight c3. We have bishop g7. And white now kind of transposes it potentially to a Grunfeld or a king's engine defense. By playing now d4, if he had wanted to keep, if he had wanted to keep it in English opening style territory, maybe g3 instead. So he's occupying the centre a bit with d4, black castles, and now seemingly a very solid, sensible move. Bishop f4. Now Fisher played quite common move here, not to play d6, but actually d5. So it's more of a Grunfeld defence flavour to it. And this next move is often uh, transposing into the Russian system of the Grunfeld, where white is losing some tempo with the queen, but is trying to establish a powerful center. So there's obvious downsides here to white's play with the, the potential tempos on the queen possible, but the upsides that is promised, the central occupation and control. So that's the trade really in chess. You often you have to get the pair together to get the advantage you have to give up something so here yeah the queen is subject to tempo gains d takes queen takes Fisher now plays c6 so he's establishing a bit more of a grip on d5 it also b5 is often on the cards here as a move to gain the tempo on the queen without moving the knights and the knight supporting that c6 pawn but b5 is enabled and that could be useful to try and influence the center we see white playing e4 so he's got what he wanted b5 is a i believe a popular move here but uh knight bd7 was played and usually here the move which is usually played is bishop e2 so let's few games in my book with this bishop e2 but white seems to be wanting to get a grip on all of black's counterplay here that seems to be the message with this next move rook d1 as though don't even think about any e5 later or a knight move perhaps an e5 don't even think about this because i'm using prophylaxis here to stop any naughtiness with e5 i'm looking at your queen x-raying the queen fisher reacts with knight b6 and another move which portrays this kind of style of play, trying to get a grip on black, totally strangling black from both sides of the board, uh, to try and say, you know, don't dare any pawn breaks. The queen actually went to c5 here. So it's kind of trying to intensify the pressure on black's dark squares. And looking at e7, there's a point to this that white wants to kind of say to black, you know, I'm going to have this Vulcan type grip here with bishop g5, putting pressure on your dark squares. 
Fisher reacts here with bishop g bishop g4 and yes it would seem sensible here uh, to try bishop e2 now sensible developing move trying to get castled but this idea of having you know trying to get a real grip on black is continued with this next move bishop g5 and it's kind of risky thing in principle to do to move the same piece twice instead of getting on with developments added to that the king is still two moves away from casting into safety so the king is on this e file we've had this piece that's moved twice but are these big issues can they actually be exploited the bishop as such is not so much an unprotected piece it's protected by the queen and the knight but Having said that, black does have the option to take away protection of that bishop to potentially leave it as an unprotected piece, which could then fall victim to potential double attacks. As we know, loose pieces tend to fall off from, from double attacks. So as well as moving the piece twice, it's not entirely safe in principle, given that black has the option of bishop takes f3. There's a lot of subtle little factors in this position, but most notably the king in the center two moves away from castling, slightly loose piece on g5, and also this queen subject to potential tempo gains. But it doesn't seem obvious here if, for example, knight bd7, the queen could step back comfortably to a3 and keep exerting this annoying dark square pressure. But there's a really stunning move that is played in this position. And if you haven't seen this game before, then it, it will come as a real shock. I'll give you five seconds to pause the video and uh, see what you can do with the black pieces. Okay, so in this position, what did Fisher play with the black pieces? So there's a few factors, as I say. This bishop slightly loose, the king in the center and the queen, potential tempo gains, but it doesn't seem obvious how to get a tempo from the queen. Okay, I'll show you now in five seconds from here. Okay, knight a4. And arguably, technically, this is one of the strongest moves of the game. It's an absolutely amazing, stunning move, exploiting all these little factors, really. The knight is protecting e4, and imagine this knight fork that's one idea and that looks at that bishop which might be loose and you might think well what about e7 but the king's on the e file so let's see all this in action what if white did take this knight here he didn't actually he retreated his queen well, let's see what happens here knight takes a4 knight takes e4 and yes we're exploiting not only a tempo gain on the queen, but that potentially loose bishop. And here it's just very, very tricky in this position. Various moves to consider. If queen c1 trying to protect the bishop, is that bishop that loose? Well, the thing is, there's another loose piece over here. And there's also the king still in the center, so queen a5 could be annoying. But technically, black does best with taking first on f3, then playing queen a5 check. And he's getting the material back. Black is getting the material back with advantage here. This is just incredibly annoying. The bishop's now loose, so you know an outrageous looking moves don't work here. You want to try and protect the bishop, so but bishop d2. Black can now play knight takes and then take on a4 and white's completely shattered here. Shattered structure, significantly worse. This is a nightmare scenario. So it seems queen c1 doesn't really help matters at all. If we look at this position, queen c1 doesn't really help matters at all. So another idea queen b4 just humbly retreating the queen at least holding the knight but then that bishop is 
is an exploitable loose piece? Or is it? Well, black technically does best to create another loose piece first. Knight takes, creating a loose knight, winning the exchange here. So, yeah, a rook against two minor pieces is quite good with the king in the center. This is really crushing. B5 with the king in the center. And white's falling to bits here. And if white tries this, the knight's loose, and this other knight's loose is going to be victimized with queen d5. And white's just really falling to bits like this, for example. Total nightmare scenario. Absolute nightmare scenario. We just rewind that. So queen b4 um, here doesn't fare that well either. So, so far, queen c1, queen b4, they're not really up to it. Bishop takes e7. This is horrible because the knight takes is actually hitting the knight on a4. And also, black can fling in a check here, which is very useful. So, knight takes a4, and again, black is hugely better in this position. You can shatter the structure and then win the b2 pawn. Absolute nightmare for black hair. Sorry, for white hair. Black would be loving this position. And one more try, a key uh, variation. Most celebrated variation of this game. Queen takes. We have the check. We can just take hair. And the king in the center is exposed in this variation. After queen takes here, bishop e7. Black can gain another tempo with bishop takes and now bishop f8 exploiting the pin and white is again in a terrible state so it seems whatever happens after knight takes a4 it seems horrible in all of those scenarios mentioned after knight takes e4 all of these factors are coming together the tempo gains on the queen the loose pieces sometimes the e file they're all coming together so yeah white trying to keep control of the position Queen a3 was played. Bishop now plays knight takes c3. B takes. And now we have knight takes e4 offering e7, opening up this e file against the king. It's a really unfortunate position, it seems. Uh, but not only is Fisher potentially ripping open the e file, he's also got his eye, eye on this diagonal being ripped open really more subtle here so what can white do in this position when well, he took on e7 now just this brilliant move queen b6 is played which occupies that b4 and supports the idea of a tactic like knight takes c3 so here it's really really tricky for white with the king in the center if he goes for bishop takes f8, then it's not just the e-file, it's actually this diagonal, believe it or not, that's been put on the scrutiny after bishop takes, bishop's rerouting to this diagonal. So say queen b3, a crushing move here would be knight takes c3. And you see that this diagonal's lit up now. It's hopeless, this position, for white. If he takes, then we have that skewer ouch and if queen takes then again this is just a nightmare of the takes black has got a crushing position here pawn up and it's just absolutely crushing okay so this this is just unbelievably bad as well so White tries now to castle. It's too little, too late. Say so bishop. So bishop c4 is played. Fisher is not letting White off here. He plays knight takes c3. So, on the surface, seemingly trying to distract the queen from the e file. So that rookie eight would be really good. But White plays what seems to be initially a very uh, resourceful move. 
He plays actually bishop c5, gaining what seems to be an important tempo on the black queen. If instead bishop takes f8 here, bishop takes, and this is just horrible, knight takes, this is just horrible for white, this position, it's all falling to bits, for example like this, using the pin. So uh, yeah, what seems to be a clever move is played bishop c5. Just to demonstrate by the way, queen takes c3 again. Here, this is just bad. This position is just better for black. Pawn up, e-file control, weak pawn on d4 under great scrutiny. So bishop c5. But now white is forfeiting casting rights because the knight is eyeing e2. So we, after the check, can't put anything in front here, really. Uh, it's pretty horrible. You might think, well, knight e5, not really. Um, black has all sorts of resources. It's, it's just absolutely horrible. You could even see it a taking an ambition d6 check. Uh, so white forfeits casting rights with king f1. Now apparently the story goes that Fisher had only 20 minutes here to reach move 40. So this is about move 16, move 17, king f1. And he takes his time here and he plays an absolutely magical move in this position against Donald Byrne, an absolutely magical move. If you haven't seen this game, you might want to pause the video here, see what you would do with black in this position. So five seconds starting from now. Okay. He didn't move the queen, his, his knight's hanging here. So it looks pretty tricky otherwise. For, it seems to be a big problem, this position. But he solves all the problems with this move bishop e6, offering the queen. Just offering a queen sack here. There are various possibilities again for white if we don't accept the queen. The bishop's been challenged here. First thing to note um, is if the bishop takes, then we can get onto this key diagonal, this, this key checking diagonal with queen b5 check. This is actually fairly terminal. It's a forced mate, actually, after king g1. Can you see how you would force mate here with black if I give you five seconds to pause the video? Okay, check here. Double check, it's the power of the double check. So nothing can be put in front. And can you see a mate in two now from this position? Five seconds, starting from now. Queen f1, and the king has been smothered. Checkmate, beautiful stuff in that variation where bishop takes e6. So the bishop's trying to stand guard uh, to this diagonal uh, from the queen using b5 potentially. But let's look at the main possibilities. Bishop d3, so standing guard on that diagonal. But here, black can save himself what would you do to save black in this position? You've got a loose knight on c3. There's a really good move here. Attack is the best form of defense. Black has knight b5 hitting white's queen, getting knight out of danger. And this, this is just better for black. For example, taking, we take here the queen, and it's just much better for black. So that's no good. Bishop d3, bishop e2, again, knight b5, just hitting the queen. This is the snag. Queen before we've got a5, we can just move the queen back and we're much better. White's 
given up casting rights. So, yeah, knight d2. We've got a really good move here. We can actually play knight b1 here, hitting the queen spectacularly. If knight takes, we can take on c4, queen c1. Knight takes d2 check. Ouch. It's all falling to bits. So there's not too many <laughs> moves apart from taking the queen here. Uh, so bishop takes b6. And it's virtually all over actually here after bishop takes b6. Because black is getting so much material for the queen. Yes, technically it's a queen sacrifice, but there's just so much material for it after bishop takes b6. The damage has really been done. And it seems so you know a combination of three things tempo gaining queen a slightly loose piece moved twice and the king in the center has resulted in this nightmare forcing sequence now after bishop takes c4 picking up a bishop check now picking up a central pawn with the seesaw checks the seesaw continues putting the king there knight c3 check the knight is very powerful on c3 now getting this bishop there's a lot of material being collected and white's rooks are not very happy about this position particularly this one is moaning here you know it's not been given a chance to, to do anything useful so far in this game and the queen is still subject to harassment still in this position it's just a nightmare where does the queen go queen c1 we've got knight e2 check so yeah queen b2 knight e2 check you know Queen has got limited squares. We have Queen B4, and we have horrible coordination now. Rook A4, and White's losing even more material. The Rook, so yeah, quite a collection of pieces, with these guys not being very useful still. The rest is just technique, essentially, of this game. It's just so much material for the Queen. A3, Rook takes A2. Yes, trying to get the Rook out at last. The rook sees some light of day, but losing f2 in the process. So we've now got king safety issues, as has been basically material down. White is a sport, though. Donald is a sport. He plays on till the mate. He plays rookie one. It doesn't really help the situation this. After knight takes e1, okay, but bishop d5, there's just too many pieces. For White's Queen, the knight is not helping. There aren't too many exploitable targets. It's not a position with great coordination with Queen and Knight. So that stumbles back. Knight e4, powerful centralization now. Queen b8. Okay, while well, the bishop's pinned, otherwise bishop d6 is, is nasty. But b5 holding that b pawn, that b pawn is pretty solid now. So all black has to do is move his king and he'll be threatening bishop d6 to win the queen here. You can imagine something like this. Bishop d6 will be winning the queen. We see h4, h5. Not letting white do anything. Knight e5, king g7. Bishop d6 still very nasty now. King moves. But now we have the final combinative play, combining the power of the pieces. This check, knight g3 check. The king is swept from one side of the board majestically to the other. Bishop b3, knight e2 check, knight c3 check, rook c2, checkmate. Wow. Fisher's first adult tournament against the former US Open champion, Donald Byrne. What a spectacular game. I thought this was worth revisiting. I hope it's good revision. Sometimes it's good to revise variations on ideas. I think some of the major lessons of this game involve the queen is a very sensitive piece. You know, you've got to be very careful in its use in the opening for tempo gains. Loose pieces is another issue, keeping the king a bit too long in the center. These were all drastically punished by Fisher in this game. Very, very instructive game. And he was only 13, and it was his first adult tournament. Incredible, the circumstances surrounding it. 
So Hans Mock called this game the game of the century. It, the media took hold of the game, even the Russians took notice, calling moves like 94 absolutely brilliant. The Russians, Botvinnik, everyone around the world took notice of this game. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.